and today I'm going to be showing you how to paint this little landscape painting called Lavender Fields. And I've chosen a special uh, group of paints today, Golden Brand sells these paints in a set. They call it their introductory set, and it's very economical. So I wanted to show you how to use these paints and paint this little landscape and get started in a way that doesn't uh, cost too much money. So we're doing this on an 8 by 10 stretched canvas. And I'm starting out, as I always do, with a simple line drawing. I'm just using a pencil this time. And I've broken up my canvas into thirds. That helps us place our composition uh, in a pleasing manner. It's called the rule of thirds. And basically, you want to put interesting parts of your painting in the places where these lines intersect. So let's just jump right in. And we're jumping in and doing the block-in phase of this painting. Over to the left I have what's called a value scale and this is just something that I've made with the Mars Black that comes in this introductory set and Titanium White to show you what I mean by values. Values are, are so very important in your painting. Each color as you add white to the paint as you can see up on the screen also will be, you can make it in different values by adding white. You could also add black to it and go even darker. But the point being, when you're trying to paint a landscape, values are critically important in helping you to establish distance in your painting. In my teaching, I've noticed that's the one thing that students struggle with the most at first. I think our eyes just aren't used to seeing things that way. We immediately see shapes and color, but we kind of gloss over the relative value. So as things move back in the picture plane, they're going to get lighter and they're going to get more blue slash gray as the water particles that are in the air between us and the distance give it that graying, bluing effect. So when you first start your painting, the first thing you want to do is don't worry about details, don't really worry about color, but just really focus on the values. Getting these large shapes, these main shapes in, in the correct value. And that gives you um, sort of a, a starting off point and something to stick to as you create your painting. and if you sometimes it's easy to get lost in a painting you'll be working on detail in one area or another and you'll forget that everything is relative so even though that might be a very dark thing if it's very much in the distance it's still going to look very light so doing your block in gives you two things the first thing it gives you is your values and the second thing it does is just covers up that white canvas as you're painting, if you don't tone your canvas down and don't put a color on it, you'll get these little sparkles of white bare canvas showing through that you end up spending a whole lot of time trying to fix. So here we are done with our block in and you can see I've got my relative values of the foreground being darker. That little spot represents the tree that's going to come up and the background being lighter. Take your time on this phase and be sure you get those values in accurately and it will make the rest of your painting go so much easier. So once you've got the block in done, um, what you see on the screen there in the little blobs of paint is something called a color card and I would really recommend you do this but even before you get started painting it gets you used to your painting colors. I've simply taken one of my colors, the green in this point that's on the in our palette, and then mixed that green with every other color on the palette and also added a little white. I just do this on, on watercolor paper and it's just a way to get to know your colors and to get to know what they do when they're mixed with each other. And you'll find it really helps you a lot in just not not being worried about it. Not, it just gives you more confidence and helps you just jump right in there and get used to mixing. Because 
as you can tell with this simple palette, uh, color, color mixing or, is what it's all about. We're starting right back in with the at the top of the painting and as you saw I've mixed up some colors for the sky, some light colors that match the light value that I blocked in earlier, putting a peachy color near the horizon and a blue up towards the top and then blending those two colors together. Back in with my small two inch round bristle brush and I use this for much of the remaining part of this video. The first part when we were doing the block in we used a, a half inch wide soft um, synthetic brush which is a really good brush to blend with and gives you a nice soft surface. You don't want a lot of texture in that background. You'll be putting more texture in the foreground when you move forward in the painting. So it's good to start out pretty light. Relative values, relative color. Do you see how I mixed up that color? And on the palette it looked fairly purple, but when I put it up next to my light purples that I've established in the background, it came out very dull looking and very gray looking. So I come back in and I just add a little blue, add a little red, add a little white. Just keep adding to the, your pile of color there until you get a color that's more pleasing to you. If you're just starting out in acrylic paints, one thing to really remember and you might not realize is you're going to dry a couple of shades darker than you started out with. So as you put the paint down on the canvas, it's going to look a little lighter than it's going to dry out to. So that's just something to keep in mind as you go. If the color looks a little dark, you want to be sure to add and, and air towards the lighter side of the color. You know, mixing colors is just, a lot of it is trial and error. So as you mix your paints, you try them out, See, I'm trying out that color and I'm comparing the value and now I want to add some pure black right there in the foreground so I know what to compare it to. Your darks in the background will never be as dark as your darks in the foreground. I think that's the one mistake I see uh, very often beginning painters making is if you put a dark, dark spot in that background, it's just going to jump right forward into the foreground and you're going to lose your illusion of distance in your painting. And, and that's something that you are really striving for at this point. So I place that little bit of pure black just to keep reminding me, okay, this is, this is black and we don't want to go that dark in the background. I'm searching for some colors here that are going to go into my background uh, trees line, my tree line. So you can see I started with the pure green, I added yellow, and uh, moved on to adding some red. I've got a little color wheel up on the screen right now. You know, the basic primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, and those mix together to make what's called the complementary colors, orange, green, and purple. So the, the key part of that color wheel at this point is that a good way to gray down a color or neutralize a color is to add a little bit of its complement to that paint color. So if I'm Using my green, I will pretty much never use a green straight from the tube. I'm going to adjust it in some way. I might be making it lighter, might be making it yellower, and I might be making it more neutral. And I do that by adding a touch of red to the green. If you're trying to neutralize a purple, you'd add yellow. If you're trying to ne neutralize a blue, you'd add orange. So that's just something to keep in mind. You can add black but somehow it be, it's just you get more interesting grays and more lively neutral effects by adding a complementary color instead of just adding black. In my normal palette I don't actually have black at all. I mix it with um, some other colors that I keep on my palette but 
there's nothing wrong with using black and certainly when you're starting out I think it's great to simplify your palette so there aren't so many choices that can be really confusing but it's amazing how many different colors you, of greens you can make as you see I've just been adding yellow and red and white and making this variety of green colors for my background tree, li tree line and you noticed I started with the dark and then I moved to a mid-range green color and now I'm coming back in with a lighter warmer color and by warmer I mean it's got more yellow and more red in it so um, in general when you when you're creating a form you're gonna have dark medium and light to it but be sure when you're adding your your white to lighten up your color don't just add white because white is going to cool your color as well and in general things are going to get warmer as they get lighter not cooler so be sure to add a little yellow a little red when you're lightening up and here I'm just doing this sun sunlit field that's in the background and my backgrounds done you want to be sure too in your background not to add too much detail because you want that background to settle back in and just as the same way as you as you see you don't see a lot of detail in uh, a background in a painting because it's in the distance and we just can't see detail that far so if you were to go in and put a lot of hard edges in that background again that would be something the same way as a dark dark it would make that background jump forward I switched over to my liner brush this is just a long thin brush and I use that to make twigs and branches and in this case I'm doing the little edges of these pine trees this this line of evergreen trees that's along the edge here and I use this brush often to add a little bit of detail and a little bit of interesting brush strokes to the painting and you hold it very loosely practice this on on your watercolor paper to the side practice this little brush stroke it's just a, a fun little loose back and forth kind of a brush stroke and uh, you want to make sure your paint has a lot of water in it it's very runny almost like ink when you uh, use this use this brush and use this stroke so now I'm moving into just creating a uh, some variations in these trees and acrylic paints a wonderful thing about them is that you can layer your brush strokes one right on top of the other you don't the, it dries almost into instantaneously and so it won't mix with the layers below it so you can go in and put layer after layer and create interest and variations that give a realistic impression without having to actually paint each branch or leaf but just give that impression so I'm using the side of my bristle brush again this is a very old uh, bristle brush that I've used for quite a while so it's it's all worn and roughed up and the rougher the better in using this technique and using this brush stroke as I picked up this one layer of paint I also picked up a little blue on my brush and when I put that on I realized oh I like that it's always good don't just use greens but add a little variation of color gives you some interest as well in these areas and so I'm just layering this painting from the back to the front and taking it step by step and having some fun with it the colors as I'm mixing them here you can see where they get more neutral I've added more red some more blue first I paint some lighter colors and then I come back with some darker colors and paint around them. We call that negative painting when we kind of paint the spaces around things. And that's really the great benefit of acrylics. You can go back and forth with the background, the foreground, the darker, the lighter. You don't really have to 
stick to a particular order of dark to light or light to dark. And if you had painted these tops of these trees and didn't like the way that, that it ended up looking, you can always come back and take your background sky color and paint back in around them. That's called painting sky holes. And that's a good way, too, to correct any mistakes. It's a great thing about acrylics is there really are no mistakes. Whatever you do, you can just come back in and paint over it again. And you're not going to create mud because the layers underneath are already dry. So I finished off on that little bunch of trees, and now I'm starting to create the lavender field. And I'm just looking for these shapes, these sort of undulating shapes that the lavender bushes make. And as I had that purple as my background, I'm now going in with some green and painting that around just to start to create these undulating shapes. And it's we're going to do the same way as we've done the rest of the painting so far, just adding layers of different shades. So I've put my red and my blue together to make a purple. Then I've added uh, some more blue to part of it and some more red to part of my little pile of color and uh, added some white to give myself a variety of values and shades of this purple color. Keep your hand loose and keep your brush stroke loose and just Follow your instinct about it. It doesn't have to be exactly the way you know your reference is. In this case, we're using my little painting as a reference. But notice how I, I'm taking my hand and I'm my whole hand is moving to create these shapes of undulating lavender bushes. Creating the top shapes and then coming back in and blending out the bottom shapes. So with acrylic paint, it's going to dry quickly, so you're not going to have a lot of time to do a lot of blending, but you do have some time. So what you have to do is lay down the paint that you're using and then rinse out your brush, get it almost dry, and come back in and blend that paint. I'll often blend out the bottom area to make that soft and leave some edges along the top. So I've added more white to my color again and I after putting in my darks the bottoms I've come back in with a medium tone and now a lighter tone just building up these layers of uh, lavender bushes. It's a lot of fun. I love lavender. It's a beautiful color and I painted the original painting that that we're doing this from originally out in the field one day, one afternoon, and it was just a lovely day in the lavender field, and that rem it reminds me of it every time I see this painting. So again, blending out the bottom area where I don't want hard edges, I don't want to see distinctive brush strokes, leaving some brush strokes along the top. Back in the furthest area there, of course, it's going to be softer. So here I'm coming back in. I've rinsed out my brush, tapped out most of the water on a paper towel, and I'm just blending that back edge to soften it. I don't want any hard edges back there. Those lavender bushes are in the distance, and so they're just going to be a little more blurry and distant. As I move forward, I'll keep more of those distinct brush strokes. Really simple um, brush stroke that I use often using the side of my brush. It tends to pick up little bits of uh, paint, leave little bits of paint in a, in a sort of a natural random order. L laying on the paint, rinsing the brush, blending the paint and then moving on to another color and if you don't like the way that turns out you just come back and try again I love this uh, part of the painting where you can just play with the details and create some interesting effects and 
it's easy and it's not stressful because whatever you do, you can come back and change it if you want to. So these purple colors are again red and blue. And since we have such a simple palette, we just have our one red and our one blue. You can add a little more red or a little more blue. And then a little yellow if you want to dull it down. A little white if you want to lighten it. You can add a little black if you want to make the color a little dull but a little darker at the same time. So here's my green. I started with that basic green color that comes with our kit adding a little yellow, a little red, a little white, and I'm placing back in some of these green stems of the lavender bushes using that same brush technique. You know, you will always have a, a shadow side and then a medium side and then your lighter side. Your shadow color will all, often be more, more dull, um, more neutralized leaning towards the cooler colors. So you're going to find that down towards the bottom. You can see I haven't put in much detail. It's a very impressionistic type of painting, but you can still tell the, what we're looking at and it leaves a little bit to the imagination. Learning your colors and your color mixing is, is a is a really fun and um, interesting thing to do and sometimes the colors that you think you're gonna get by mixing kind of surprise you that's why I really suggest get yourself some some inexpensive watercolor paper and take this little palette of paints and mix them every which way together mix two colors together three colors together see what happens when you mix the yellow and the blue what kind of green you get versus using the green that came with the palette. Practice these brush strokes on your paper first too. These little dry brush techniques of creating little bits of highlight. I've gone to a very light color of purple now and creating these little highlights. So as you practice with your colors, it's really nice to do the color cards that I was showing you earlier where you make one little card for each color that you have and mix it with each of the other colors that you have. And you can save those color cards as a reminder when you're thinking about colors and which ones to use. We we're using four uh, simple brushes in this painting. This little number two bristle brush, a half inch wide soft synthetic brush that we used for our block in, and we're using a liner brush which is a long thin soft brush that you can use to make twigs and branches and we'll use it to make the limbs of the little tree we're going to do. Uh, pretty soon. And then I also have a very small number two filbert synthetic brush. A filbert just means it's like a flat brush but the edges of the flat brush are rounded off to make it almost an oval shape and we're going to use that brush when we do our foreground. Uh, we're going to put some all kinds of fun little weeds and grasses and wild daisies in the foreground and we'll use that little filbert brush to do that. So you can do this painting with this um, simple little set of golden acrylic paints or another brand of paint. I just uh, chose them because they had this economical set that I thought would be great for somebody just wanting to start out. And four brushes, um, eight by ten canvas which you can get at any art supply store or craft supply store. Watch out for those sales. Michaels particularly has some great sales on canvases and you can get these these little canvases for what amounts to about a dollar a piece when you hit the sales and 
buy them in a little packet of six or so. So I'm a great one for not investing too much money and not being too worried about the cost of what you're doing so you're afraid to try and practice and experiment because your greatest teacher is going to be your easel. That's where you're going to learn. Books are great and videos are great and classes are great but it really just takes time. Time at the easel. Time getting to know your paints, getting to know the tools and getting used to them and what they do. So I'm laying in along this foreground just really loosely and really quickly just a number of different colors of greens and darks and just laying in the background so that I can put some more things on top. That layering is really the key with with acrylic paints. You can just go crazy and have fun and not worry about making mistakes because you can just layer right over the top. So once I've filled in the whole area with um, different shades of greens, darker to lighter, I'll come back and add just a tiny bit of detail. We're clear up in the foreground now so things are going to be a little more clear, our edges are going to be a little more sharp, and that helps to establish that this is the foreground. Using some red in there to add some variety of color. It's real important to not just use greens, not just use one color in different shades, but to add some, some different colors and some different tones to create that interest. So you can see I've switched back again to my liner brush and this brush is best used holding it very loosely and using a flicking motion to create little interesting dots and dashes and lines just to create that illusion of, of the of a buried uh, wildflower area. It's kind of hard to see with my hand in the way as I'm doing this, but try it with your watercolor paper. Be sure to get your paint wet, add water to it until it's almost like an ink consistency, and then just hold your brush in this. If you use the backward and forward motion like I've showed you, it gives you an um, impression of little of bits of leaves and edges of leaves peeking through the grasses. And then if you hold it and lay it and flick it, you get uh, a look of grasses. You notice how I'll, I'm brushing the paintbrush back and forth in the paint once I get it mixed. That creates a sharp edge, a very fine sharp edge on your paintbrush. So when you gently flick, just gently touch the canvas, you can get a very thin mark. It's really good to vary the thickness and the thinness of the little grasses that you're putting in here so that it's just not all the same. Moving over to that tiny little filbert brush, now I'm going to start putting in some of our little daisies and wildflowers in the foreground. I'm mixing up a blue when I do the flowers, I always start with the shadow color first. Any, anything that you put down there is going to have a shadow to it, and then the sunlight will be hitting it. So I just mixed a, a blue with some blue and a little bit of black and some white to make a sort of a shadow color to these dancing daisies. I have another one of my videos where I do uh, a bunch of daisies too that you might want to watch on my YouTube channel or on my website paintwithkarenalari.com. It's a great little free website where you can see um, a bunch of the videos that I've made and interact with your fellow artists and get critiques on the paintings that you're doing. So once I set down that shadow color, I'm setting down some lighter highlighted areas. And notice how I'm just using that brush and setting it down and lifting it up real quickly. It just creates um, some 
impressions of the flower petals. You don't want to paint in each petal. It makes it look too stiff and unnatural. And all these little flowers will be, some will be facing us, some will be up, some will be sideways, some will be down. So you want to vary their sizes, their locations, their orientations. That's what give it will give it a, a sort of a natural wild flower kind of a look. So, you know, stay loose with this, have fun with it. And again, if you get an area that you really hate, you can get your your paper towel wet. You should always have a paper towel in your hand. You could get that wet and wipe it out right away. Or if it's already dried, just cover it back over it with your greens that are in the background and try again. You can do this as many times as you want and so you don't have to worry about it. And I've mixed up a yellow shadow color here to put on the base of the center of the flowers and also as the shadow color to some, some little yellow, maybe some mustard weed or something like that. So I just added some little bit of black to the yellow to dull it down a little bit and make it a shadow color. Placing that in the in the centers of the daisies and then just creating just work your way back and forth over the this front area be loose and just have fun and drop those little flowers in there however they might be growing you can use any colors you want you can use any shapes you want it's your painting and it's your your field of wildflowers I, I really liked in this painting the uh, contrast between the rows of, of planted lavender fields that are kind of symmetrical and then this sort of chaotic bunch of wildflowers in the front. I thought that was fun. So added, adding now the brighter yellow color. So I put a shadow down for the centers of the daisies and now I came back with a yellow to which I just added a little bit of red to warm it up a little bit and a little bit of white to lighten it and just adding that to the shadow yellow that I already put down. If you use this, this basis of lay down a shadow color, lay down a medium tone which they often call the local color of whatever you're making, in other words, you know, a, a daisy center is yellow or a daisy's white, the local color would be yellow. So you lay that down and then you come back with a highlight color and just touch that on the tops. So once you once you put down the yellow then go back in and do add even more white to your yellow. And remember when you're going lighter with the shade you want to add a little bit of red or a little bit of some warm color, red or yellow, because if you just add white, your color is going to cool down. We tend to think of colors as warm, reds and yellows, and cool, blues, and greens are more cool. Um, a green would be warmer than a blue because it's got some yellow in it. So it's all about relativity, you know, colors can look very different depending on what other colors that they're close to. So you're always comparing. You always want to compare. And and when you're trying to match a color, you think to yourself, well, is the color I'm trying to match warmer than this? Is it redder than this? Is it greener than this? And then just add a little bit of that color to your paint mixture. You can tell I used that same concept throughout the whole painting warmer shadow, I mean darker, cooler shadow, a local color, and then a lighter, warmer highlight. You see again I've come back in with some greens and I'm using that kind of back and forth loose texturing kind of a kind of a brush stroke. Practice that on your on your watercolor paper, practice it right on your painting because you can paint over it if you don't like it but it makes it look like there's a few little leaves kind of jumping out. Going back in here with a, a darker color, you, you want to make sure in the foreground you get some real pops of dark because you are now in the foreground so you can use your darkest darks. 
So I'm just going back in and touching here and there and that that just makes it look like there's that's the shadows that are underneath our wildflowers and gives us some contrast in this area which is is nice to have. You can have a lot of fun with this putting in some grass, coming back with a lighter color, going back in with a darker color. And a lot of times you want, might think, well, how do I know when I'm done? And for me, I just kind of just glance at the area and I ask myself, is anything grabbing my attention? Is there any area where the edge looks too sharp or, or it looks too soft or murky or just something that grabs your attention? Just use your instinct and if anything grabs your attention, just go in and add to it take away from it. Here I'm just adding a few little sparkly highlights here and there where maybe the bit of grass has caught the sun. And that's all there is to it for doing a little field of wildflowers. Last part of our painting that we're going to do today is our tree. I love painting trees. I love trees. There are so many variety of trees and so many personalities in trees and there's so much fun to do because you don't have to be, it's not like a doing a portrait or doing a building where it's really obvious if you didn't do it exactly the way the reference was. In painting trees and landscapes in general, you can just have fun and paint them however you want them to be and, and uh, I really enjoy that. This is a little a little summer tree. It's got its its full leaf, fully leafed out and green and happy little tree. So I'm starting with my liner brush and just laying in a trunk. I don't like to use a line drawing, especially when I do a landscape like this, because it tends you when you do a line drawing, you tend to start working within the lines and it kind of just in your mind makes you afraid to step outside the lines and do something different and, and it, it makes your painting feel more controlled and rigid. It's a lot more fun just to to be bold and to be loose and have fun with it. You can't make mistakes. This is acrylic so it, whatever you do you can fix it. You notice I started with a darker color. I used that black, added a little red little blue and then use that in the base area and then as you move outward into your branches they're going to get thinner and lighter. Coming back over the dark and adding a, a lighter side to it. The, the light in my painting today is coming from the left hand side. It's fairly high in the sky a little over to the left so as I've been painting this whole thing, I've been putting more of my highlights towards the left side. I've gone back to my bristle brush, my roughed up old bristle brush, and a dark color. Again, starting with my dark in this tree and moving to light. And what I'm thinking about here, I'm just got a lot of paint on that brush, and I'm just tapping the brush down straight down on its end, and I've tap the brush on my palette first to kind of splay out those bristles and I'm thinking about keeping keeping openness in this tree. It's really easy to lose all that background that you already put in by covering it over so you want to keep that openness. I come, I'm coming back with my brush which has been rinsed off and tapped dry on my paper towel to do some blending. I'm, as you can see, I'm keeping some of the edges more distinct and clear as if you're looking at individual leaves, but I'm blending out also some of the areas because if you leave them all sharp like that, um, it just doesn't look too natural. So I've got some water on my brush and I'm blending it. You can see that it's getting pretty close to dry, which is making it harder, but I want to keep those open spots where you can see through to the background. 
So I'm, I've put some water on my brush. I'm using my paper towel. And because it's still slightly wet, I can just rub those areas out where I feel like it's gotten too thick. If it's gotten too dark, too dry, and you feel like you've filled it in too much, you can always come back in with the background color and paint the background color back in around. I especially want to keep this little shape at the bottom of the tree, just trying to have a graceful little shape to it. So since I put in the dark, now I'm moving to a more distinctly green color. Again, the local color of the tree is green. So your mid-tone is, is usually the most you know, distinctly green color that you use. So that will come right over back over the top. You can see a little more clearly here how I use this brush stroke, just tapping down on the end of my bristle brush after I've tapped it into the palette to kind of open those bristles up and splay them out. So I, as I dip back into my palette, I also um, vary the color a little bit. It's as when you're looking at something, the light is going to be hitting it differently. So you're very seldom going to have the exact same color from one end to the other. So it's real easy as you go along just to add a little bit of blue, a little bit of yellow, and go back and forth that way. You can see here, I'm mixing myself up three different colors of green. So I've got a lighter green, I've got a green that, with more yellow in it, and a green with more red. And I, as you can see, I took my brush on the side and just rolled it through all three of those colors that I had on the palette. That creates, it gives you that those three different distinct colors on your brush at the same time. So it just helps you to really get some variety and some in your in your color without having to go back in three different times to create it. Thinking about the edges and the way the light is hitting from the right hand side, creating that lighter area. And just taking my time, I've edited a out a lot of the pauses in between this so that this video doesn't take too long but I spend a lot of time just I stop and I look and I kind of step back and squint my eyes and look at what I've done so far and uh, that that helps a lot take your time and and have fun with it and look and see which areas are grabbing your eye which areas are working which areas aren't so I've mixed up an even lighter color and um, going back in. I didn't talk about this palette when I began, but this is what's called a Stay Wet palette. You can use any kind of a plastic container with a sealable lid. Even to-go containers I find for like sandwiches and things like that uh, work really well. I put down a couple of layers of paper towel and I wet them down with a spray bottle. And then I put a piece of what's called disposable palette paper on top of that. What this does is just keeps your acrylic paint moist during the painting process. It has a tendency to dry out. So if you keep your paint on this kind of a, a moist paper palette background, it keeps it wet for quite a while. And then when you seal it up, it'll stay wet literally for weeks and you don't waste paint that way. I also keep a really small little spray bottle next to me as I'm painting and you can just mist that paint during the paint process, especially if it's a hot summer, dry summer day, you, you're going to find your paint on your palette drying out, so that really helps. So as you can see, I've just gone progressively lighter with my colors on my little tree and now I've come in with a, a very light color and then come back and blend out some of the edges so that you get that combination of soft edges, things blending together, and then a few of the little leaves kind of breaking out and breaking free. And you don't have to define each little leaf. You just want to define a few, and then that makes it seem like it's a, 
a tree without really making it feel stiff. And again, this is the time when I just take my time, step back, and, and have fun with it. You can see those warmer green colors that have more red in them, and those medium greens and going into the dark greens. And then I've been sure to leave some holes there so you can still see that background through it. I want to come back and touch up that trunk just a little bit more. It's really fun to do bark because, again, you don't have to follow exactly what's in your reference, but if you just add little touches of color, dark, light, medium, and be sure to be loose with that application. You don't want it to seem stiff. You can see when I do branches also, I tend to go in not in one direction and not in one movement, kind of a stop-start movement and changing direction with your limbs and your twigs that gives it a more natural look to it. Just adding back in some of those branches to my tree, putting that lighter side over on the side that's more sunlit, coming back in with some dark again. I just want to show that texture to that tree. And this dark is just made, I'm using that black and adding some red to it, some yellow to it, and varying the color as I go uh, back and forth from lights to darks. So it's a lot of mixing when you're doing um, acrylic painting. And I've obviously again edited a lot of that out so that this doesn't take too long, but don't feel bad about the, you know, the fact that you probably spend as much time mixing as you do putting that paint on onto the canvas. Especially when you're first starting, you have to learn learn these colors. They're like notes on a scale, you know, you have to to learn your scale and learn which goes together and, and what will give you the effect you're looking for. And eventually it will just become more and more automatic. See, I mixed up a, a fairly bright pinkish color with that red and the white and a little yellow. Just want to add touches of warmth to that trunk. You don't want to keep it all in the grays and the darks, and you certainly don't want to keep it all brown. Tree trunks are not very often brown, or very little of the tree trunk is actually brown. So once you, you'll find as the more you paint, the more you look at the world around you differently. Our minds want to tell us that certain things are certain colors, but when we when you actually stop and look at them, you realize, oh, that tree trunk really hardly has any brown in it at all. It's mostly grays and blacks and oh, I see some blues and some reds. That's the fun part. All of a sudden you're looking at the world in a whole different way. So as I stepped back from this painting at this point, I realized I wanted some more red purples in the lavender to give more variety. And then as I put that red purple in there, I add a little bit to my foreground. In order to integrate the different parts of your painting, it's uh, really important to add those little touches of the same colors throughout the painting, even though you may not seem like, well, this isn't an area that has red in it, but you'll be surprised if you just touch in that little bit of red in amongst your greens or blues in amongst your greens. It really integrates your, your painting and makes it feel like all these different areas are in the same light and they're in the same place back to just a little more of that brighter pink color. I'm drawing the eye with the little path that I made down the center back into the painting and into our tree. That's a part of composition that we haven't really spent much time on on this, on this video, but in many of my other videos I spend more time on compos composition and it's a very important part of painting. Adding those last little very bright light highlights. I leave the top edge of the brush stroke uh, crisp 
and then I'm blending out those bottom edges so they blend right back in to the and with the uh, rest of the the lavender bushes making them the other reason that I put those warmer colors around the tree has to do with drawing your eye back into the painting to that focal point tree and varying the colors across the painting so that it's just not the same shades of blue and purple all the way across. So again, stepping back, kind of squint your eyes, glance at the painting, and turn your head away and glance at it quickly. And anything that catches your eye, any place that's that just strikes you as a little wrong, just go back and analyze it. What's is it the edge that's wrong? Is it the color that's wrong? Is it the value that's wrong? Those three things you'll hear me talking about again and again. This little edge of our trees over here was grabbing my attention. It was sort of a dark, harsh edge. So I came back in and softened that up with the purples and had those purples going back up over the tree. The last thing I looked at as I stepped back and looked at my painting overall is my focal point tree was just seemed a little dull. Again, acrylic paints are going to dry darker than when you set them down on the canvas. So as the tree dried out, it started looking more and more dull, especially against those nice bright pinky colors that I put in to the lavender field. You'll find that pinks and greens together, pinks and Lavenders and greens together are a really nice combination. They seem to set each other off and, and really sing as a color combination. So I just don't want to come back over everything I've done, but I wanted to unify some of those areas and add this really bright green. Something you want to be careful of when you're doing trees is not to create little spotty areas that are disconnected with each other. You want to kind of connect the areas. It just is a more pleasing effect when you're when you're doing a tree and when you're doing anything really. It's it's just one of those things that is going to improve the overall look of your painting. So you can see how that brighter, more more vivid green just kind of really help that tree to come to life and helped it to be able to to stand up color wise against those more vivid purple colors we're just about done with our little painting today and I really want to encourage you to check out my website paintwithkarenalari.com uh, where you're welcome to join us and learn to do this painting, some more other paintings, post your paintings so that other people can comment on them and I can give you critiques on them. And it's a lot of fun and we'd love to have you join us. So I'm just signing our little painting today of Lavender Fields. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope I see you again soon. Take care.